This week, sequestration could hobble aviation for years. The bankruptcy court denies AMR's request to scrap its pilot's contract. And Aspen Avionics Connected Pilot wins STC approval. I am Ashley Hale. Welcome to the Friday twice weekly edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. A study released Monday by the Aerospace Industries Association and eConsult Corporation estimates that budget cuts to FAA operations as a result of sequestration could cost up to 132,000 aviation jobs, cause an annual decrease of 37 to 73 million in passenger emplanements, see annual reductions of 1 to 2 million pounds of transported air freight, and would also have a devastating impact on the next generation air traffic control system, delaying system implementation by a decade or more. Sequestration is the make a deal or else compromise of automatic and indiscriminate spending cuts that are to take place if Congress cannot agree to a deficit reduction bill. The cuts were designed to be so damaging that Congress would have no choice but to reach a deficit reduction deal in order to prevent their implementation. Stephen P. Mullen, the author of the study, said, quote, Sequestration would force the FAA to slash operations, bringing gridlock to the skies today, or defund modernization and infrastructure work. The closer we study sequestration, the more destructive it turns out to be, end quote. Sequestration will be automatically triggered January 2nd, 2013, unless Congress acts this year to repeal or delay it. U.S. bankruptcy judge Sean Lane, who is overseeing the AMR bankruptcy case, has denied AMR's request to abandon its collective bargaining agreements with its pilots' union. The decision, announced Wednesday, is seen as a setback in AMR's attempt to cut more than $1 billion a year in labor costs. The judge's ruling came just a week after Americans' pilots rejected a proposed offer that would have granted them pay raises and a 13% stake in the airline once it emerged from bankruptcy. Reuters reports that AMR plans to revise its motion and resubmit it to the judge, possibly as early as today, Friday, and will seek an expedited ruling. AMR has already reached consensual labor terms with its ground workers union, and its flight attendants have until Sunday to conclude a vote on a new proposed agreement. Aspen Avionics has confirmed the Supplemental Type Certificate approval of Connected Pilot, the first in its series of the company's revolutionary Connected Panel product line that provides a wireless link between certified instrument panel avionics and portable smart devices. The patent-pending connected pilot seamlessly synchronizes aviation application data from personal handheld devices with the certified avionics installed in an aircraft's panel. Designed for Apple iOS mobile devices such as iPads and iPhones, connected pilot is able to receive data such as own ship position from almost any panel-mounted GPS navigator. Brad Hayden, Aspen's Vice President of Marketing, says Connected Pilot provides synchronized two-way communication between the mobile device and the aircraft certified avionics. It's also expandable and can grow in functionality over time as new connected products are developed. A true game changer, Connected Pilot is available for over 900 makes and models of aircraft and is available for $2,499. You're watching Airborne when we come back, shopping for a new Air Force One. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put
put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or a podcast, send us an email to news by at aero-news.net. Well, the Pentagon is looking at replacing the Boeing 747-200B VC-25A aircraft, which serves as Air Force One when the President is on board. The acquisition program was authorized late last week by Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Frank Kendall. The current VC-25A aircraft entered into service in 1990 with an expected service life of 30 years. That would put them at the end of their service in another eight years. According to published reports, the program will first focus on a market analysis of performance requirements. That information will be reviewed by the Joint Chiefs and will form the basis for a decision whether to sole source from Boeing or open a competitive bid. The plan outlined by Kendall looks for an RFP to be submitted to the aircraft industry in 2015. The contract for the new Air Force One could be let as early as 2016. The pilot of a Kip Fox was probably more than a little surprised to see a pair of NORAD F-15s on an intercept course last week. But that's what happened when even the smallest aircraft finds itself in violation of yet another in a multitude of presidential TFRs. The incident happened about 18.30 Eastern Time last Monday over Long Island where President Obama was attending two fundraising events. The FAA interviewed the pilot of the Kit Fox. It was not known if he would be charged or disciplined, but seriously, can you imagine the look on the faces of those pilots when they found out they were tracking a Kit Fox with an F-15? The New York Daily News reports that the second aircraft reportedly strayed into a TFR near New Haven, Connecticut. About an hour later, it was also intercepted by F-15s, but allowed to continue on to its destination. New certification procedures released Monday by the FAA remove a requirement for additional psychological tests for pilots diagnosed with gender identity disorder that were not reported for other pilots. Under the previous rules, transgender pilots were required to undergo a psychological test that some advocacy groups say prevented those pilots from working and may have cost them their jobs. The Human Rights Campaign says on a blog that the new rules mean transgender pilots will be treated just like their peers. From the ice of Greenland to the Big Easy, my gal Sal is heading to a new home. The vintage World War II bomber, which spent more than 50 years buried in a Greenland glacier, is being shrink-wrapped and prepped for a move from Blue Ash Airport near Cincinnati to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. The move is the result of a battle between Blue Ash and the city of Cincinnati neither of which wants to pay to keep Blue Ash Airport open past August 29th. The B-17 Flying Fortress went down in Greenland in 1942 and was salvaged from the ice in 1995. She was acquired by Bob Reddy, who had hoped to build a museum around the plane. But the squabble between the two municipalities means the likely loss of the airport to the community and that would leave my gal Sal without a home. So she's on her way to the museum in New Orleans where she'll be showcased in a new $30 million building. Reddy said he is honored to donate the plane to the museum, but is sad to see it go so far away. Well, thank goodness it's Friday, and that means it's time for Jim Campbell's barnstorming commentary. 
Today, Jim talks about his recent opportunity to see Oshkosh from a unique perspective. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. In the next few weeks, you'll be reading about our analysis and commentary on the Oshkosh that just concluded. It was a fascinating week for us. Uh, from our standpoint, one of the best we've ever had from a workflow and from what we were able to accomplish, but also one of the most interesting from a standpoint of just plain old politics. If you look at what was going on with EIA, uh, some of what was going on with AOPA, what was happening with the industry, what was happening with kits, with GA, with sport aviation, and the industry overall, this was a great year to be watching the politics of aviation. Not necessarily a positive year in terms of result, but certainly fascinating. But it was something else for me that, you know, frankly, I hadn't thought about in quite some time. Because this year, four members of my family came out for their first Oshkosh. Among them, my mother and my father, who, uh, frankly, surprised the, you know, the blazes out of me by saying that they wanted to come and not only did come, but had a heck of a time. A nephew who's currently learning to fly, one of two right now in the, uh, among the Campbell clan that are in the process of earning their wings. And the uncle that I'm literally named after and a fellow who's been a private pilot for a number of decades. Overall, it was their first Oshkosh. It was their first opportunity to battle the crowds and the heat and the craziness and the distances and all the things that go with Oshkosh and experience the wonders of all that aviation has to provide. I was fascinated by their reaction. I mean, I always look at Oshkosh from a standpoint of we aviators and we flyers and all the people in the industry. But for my folks who are not pilots, for an uncle who's been a pilot and has unfortunately been out of it for quite some time because of business interests, and for a nephew in his early 30s who's in the process right now of learning to fly and getting ready to solo, this was a phenomenal spectrum to watch how they associated the most exciting event in aviation with what aviation means to them. Now, my folks have put up with my flying since day one. It's always been an interesting event uh, in our lives. Uh, it scared the bloody blue blazes out of my mother when I was a kid, and especially since I soloed a glider at 14 and powered at 16 and so forth and so on. So she put up with it. But over the years, she came to appreciate it and be fascinated by the things that she saw me experiencing and dealing with. But boy, did this open up her eyes. She came through there. She loved what she saw. She had a great time with it. Um, they did take advantage, my parents, of the Aviators Club, which is somewhat controversial. But for somebody in their 70s, the ability to sit back, relax, get a meal, do so in air conditioning, well, that was a really good move for them. And I, uh, I highly applaud the fact that there is such a facility. I just wish it wasn't a place that didn't block out so much of the view along with the chalets. But I have a feeling that EA is going to rethink that. But here's the most amazing thing of all. Even though my folks aren't aviators, my uncle's been out of it for a while, and my nephew is just starting to get, uh, get involved in all this, they all said to a single person, they'll be back. They want to come back. There's more to see, more to do. And I'll tell you what, for the half a million or so that really did come to Oshkosh, and for four in particular that never really gave it that much of a concern or had never experienced it for themselves before, wow, we've got something going here. But how do we leverage it? How do we introduce people to the wonders of aviation through Oshkosh and other auspices? I'd like to hear what you think. But for me, great week. Great week in more ways than one. And for my family, maybe I won't take so much crap over all my flying anymore. Who knows? Thanks so much. This is Jim Campbell with the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course Airborne. See you later, folks, and go fly something. A pair of skydivers who had departed from St. Mary's Airport in southeast Georgia found they had some splaining to do when they landed in a baseball diamond on a U.S. Navy submarine base. And their situation was complicated by the fact that one of the skydivers was not a U.S. citizen. The jumpers had planned to land back at the airport during their Sunday outing when a strong wind blew the pair off target and they wound up on the base. The jumpers were not aware they landed on a naval base until they were approached by military personnel. One of the jumpers was a naturalized U.S. citizen, but the other was not a citizen and not carrying his passport, according to Jay Stafford, chair of the St. Mary's Airport Authority. Military officials were reportedly very stern, but also very understanding about the wing conditions that had blown the jumpers off course. Apparently, the most recent aerial photographs the skydiving company has 
shows trees where the baseball diamonds are now, which added to the jumpers' confusion about their location. Sounds like someone needs to update their Google Earth account. That's our program for Friday, August 17th, 2012. Remember, Airborne is now seen here twice weekly on Tuesdays and Fridays on Aero TV. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're Airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next Tuesday with another edition of Airborne.